I was, I was almost mentioned, um, uh, I have a startup company, uh, which, uh, well, actually, it's kind of pivoting. Originally, it was called Eve Tech, but we're actually uh, co-founding a new company this summer. It's called uh, Eve Unmanned Vehicles. And really what our mission is, is to be a part of this really great personal drone revolution that's starting to take place. Um, it's a really exciting time. I'm sure most of you all here know of Amazon Air Prime. Um, actually, I heard this last week. Um, it was discovered that they actually started hiring, uh, Amazon started hiring computer programmers and um, I believe they were also hiring some marketing people and people that do PR and they're setting up their satellite office um, up in Silicon Valley and I thought that was pretty cool. So it's actually not really just a gimmicky thing, like Amazon really wants to pull through with this 30 minutes you'll have your product from one of their warehouses or less. So I think that's really cool. Um, another really exciting thing is that the FAA, which has really kind of been holding back this uh, revolution, recently released uh, that they were going to be willing to offer, um, I believe, uh, like basically permission for low risk um, commercial drone applications by November. And that means like agriculture, aerial photography, so it's actually going to happen this year, not next year. So that's another thing that's really exciting. Um, OK, so I guess. So it's uh, self-directed, or does it still have to be controlled by a person? Um, actually, I think, I think they're allowing autopilot. Or that's, that's what it sounds like. So um, it's, it's really, it was on, it was on the doityourselfdrones.com last week. So yeah, it's still like the news is still like surfacing, but it looks like they're more receptive now because uh, this is one of those things that they really can't, like I don't think they, they're going to be able to stop it completely. I know they really like to regulate as much as possible and they should, but I mean drones of a certain size are not going to harm people, or at least I don't think they will, if, but there, they have, there have to be rules. So like our startup is actually, um, what we're trying to build is something called a electric ducted fan multi-rotor multi vehicles. And these two are um, uh, two of our concepts. Um, I actually removed the batteries and the autopilot. Uh, I left my garage in a hurry about 30 minutes ago, so I didn't want to carry that much weight with me. But um, the idea is really um, we're going to be launching two products this summer. Uh, one's going to be called the Nimbus 3S, and the other one's called the Nimbus 4S. Um, Really what we want to do is we want to build um, our quadcopters um, to be really, really, I guess, powerful. Um, well, let me think of a word. Um, power dense. That's really what we're trying to go for. Um, right now, there, you can't buy a ducted fan multi-rotor vehicle on the market. Like if you try and find a ducted fan drone, you're pretty much out of luck. I mean, they've been built before, but you really can't buy one. So we really want to be the first to market with a uh, ducted fan um, quadcopter drone. And what's really cool about ducted fans is a ducted fan will usually always give you more thrust than um, in terms of like volume and area like taken than a propeller ever would. And that's really cool because I really think that the industry is going to want things that are really compact. I mean, people don't want to have like a, a lawnmower-sized drone. They want to have a drone that they can pretty much fit in a backpack, but that can still do a lot for them. Um, we really believe that within the next year or the next two years, you should be able to order your McDonald's Big Mac from home and be able to send your drone to go and pick it up, out, uh, to pick it up for you. Um, so to be able to do that, we really think that you're going to need a drone that has a lot of power in a small package. Now, what you trade off for this is you don't have as much flight time as you would as a free propeller drone. So like you can have a quadcopter this size with uh, basically like propellers about this big and you'll be getting about maybe 12 minutes, 15 minute flight time out of it, but you'll only be able to carry about a pound or two pounds. Whereas you can have this drone, which is about the same size, but it can carry 10 pounds, but it can only do it for about three minutes 
or like, you know, without payload, it could probably do it for like about seven. So we're trading flight time for power. I mean, you really can't have both. But like I said, we really want to be the best in the world at payload, taking like a payload from point A to point B. Like, Flight time is, yeah, something that is really going to come as long as battery technology keeps on progressing. But, um, but yeah, no, so uh, we really want to have an advantage of being able to carry a lot of weight, even if it's only a short distance. I have a suggestion for you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, our refueling stations have an inductive charger mm -hmm. so that they can just land at a base charge up without having to plug in. That's a, that's a really good suggestion. Actually, we're looking into that, but um, really not for charging, for battery swap. Because these batteries, people want to be able to get their package from one side of town to the other side of town in five, ten minutes. Like, you know, and obviously, you're not going to be dealing with stoplights, so you'll be able to go pretty much from point A to point B without stopping. Um, the thing is, recharging these batteries takes 45 minutes, an hour. I mean, they're high, they're high current batteries, but even then it takes a while to recharge them. So we're coming up with a system in which a drone would be able to land, probably using like Bluetooth triangulation or something, and instantly it lands, the battery's pulled out, moved aside, a new battery that's already fully charged put in. You're looking about a turnaround time of about like 20, 30 seconds. It'll be back in the air, versus having to wait there for the battery to recharge. Um, Mm, who knows, maybe in the future you will have like, batteries like that. I know that there's some batteries now that they're talking about can be fully charged in under a minute. But, um, but yeah, no, so another thing that we're actually looking into maybe doing is um, the cool thing about, like I said, we have payload capability. That means we can carry a lot of weight. So why not carry your own power plant? Um, we're talking with Dr. Sarkar of maybe having a senior design team um, out of the College of Engineering for this next year to look into maybe putting like a micro turbine or maybe even like you know an auto engine on the actual uh, like ETF multi-rotor vehicle that can actually be making its own power. It's basically the same way that we get power from power plant. You have like you know combustion, turning these turbines, basically turning a jenny that creates electricity. Why not do that and put it on a multi-rotor? I mean you can get something like that in a way maybe five pounds maybe six pounds, a really small compact one. Um, you wouldn't be able to do that with a regular propeller quadcopter, but you could do it with this technology. So that's something that we might be looking into as well. But um, any questions? You know, this is, re this is really something that I wanted to do back and forth. Um, yeah, Nick? Do you have the most powerful type of propellers? Uh, the Ducks right now, um, this one is uh, running on a four cell battery. Usually a higher cell gives you more thrust. Yeah, 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 of course. If, if you look at them right here. What's the difference? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, the thing is, the, the blade pitch is a lot steeper. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing is because the blades are a lot smaller, um, you can rotate at a much faster rate. Basically, a propeller, like on a plane, is limited, of, like its RPM is limited, basically on how fast the tip of that propeller blade is rotating, I mean like traveling. So you'll have like, you know, a prop maybe this big. Um, as soon as like basically you're measuring the rate of rota the RPM as, as the blade is rotating, um, you don't want the blade to travel faster than the speed of sound. Because the moment it travels, it breaks the sound barrier, the, babe, the blade begins to vibrate, wobble, it could even like shatter because of the sound like boom. So, you want blades that are really short. That way they can do a lot of RPM. Because if you have a blade that's like this long, that's not going to be able to do over 10,000 RPM because you're going to be in risk of the tip of the blade breaking the sound barrier. So because you have really short and like small blades, you have like 60,000 RPM out of this duct, which you would not be getting out of a regular propeller. And usually most uh, like quadcopter propellers are probably at max thrust going about 8,000, 10,000 RPM. So we're getting about six times that. But because of that, like I said, you have shorter flight time because you're consuming a lot, of more, a lot more power. Uh, you have a quadcopter like the Phantom or the Iris, which are uh, the two flagship models for um, 
uh, DJI Innovations and 3D Robotics, which are two drone consumer drone makers, and uh, and they're running about like maybe 18 amps per second at max thrust, maybe 20 amps. These are running 66 amps per second, and these are running 85 amps per second. Can so the they place break? Hmm? Is it possible for the place to break, and if they did, what would happen if someone? If if they if they've broken before, actually, and the cool thing is because they're within a contained duct. Most of the debris, like basically, it gets uh, it gets shielded by a deck, and the rest of it, like basically, kind of like shoots out through the bottom. I've I've never been at the other end of one, like you know, <laughs> failing, and I I don't want to be. Yeah, it was that far away from a general breaking once, and it's kind of scary. So I can imagine what that would be like. Yeah, I know. The 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 hair on the back of your neck, like it stands whenever you're around these because they they're banshees. They're really loud. Uh, yeah. uh, because they're being closed. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, increase the length of the blades within the enclosure and get more power out of it if you're running at the same? Uh, oh, you're basically saying if, if a regular propeller had a duct? Instead of having one, two, three, four, five, six of those things around it, could you make three big ones or four of them that are a little bit bigger and have more power? Um, I guess you could. You could, but you probably wouldn't get as much RPM because, like I said, the longer the blade, the less but RPM it's more it can do. Snap, but if it's in that enclosure, well, it even has to, it's but the thing is, you're still going to be breaking the sound barrier inside inside the duct, even if uh, like the duct really isn't shielding you from like the sonic boom or anything. Like once the once the barrier is broken, even if it's in a duct, like the blade could be in you know in peril. So at that size. It's Oh no, it's not. It's, I mean, you really—it's pretty easy to calculate. Um, you know the the diameter. You can calculate the circumference. You know the RPM. You can pretty much calculate how fast it's traveling. Uh -huh. It it would uh, the way that we're thinking about it is that it would be um, spinning a. And a gen like a DC motor, which would just be a, a generator, and it would be going directly to the ducted fans, and then we would have the we would also have a battery there um, to basically supplement it. So I I don't think I really don't want to complicate our lives. We could actually have it go to the battery, then from the battery go to the ducts, but I think it would be better just to go straight to the ducts. Is there any way of curving? <coughs> Yeah. Doing other things. Could you also use that on those uh, you, the way units to decrease the noise? Because I know it's I, I'm not really that, uh, like, I, I, I've heard that um, in aerodynamic theory that the <coughs> most efficiency you'll get out of a prop is when it's only two. And the reason why you add propeller blades is to get more thrust for a smaller area. That's what I, that's what I've heard. So I mean, I guess in theory, another thing is that we don't design these ducts. Like you know, not yet. As much as one of our engineers really wants to make them, um, David. Right now, we don't make them ourselves. We buy them off the shelf. So, so yeah, no. Um, this video that they're showing is in India. It's in I think it's in Mumbai. My friend, my friend actually, my friend told me about this. It's pretty cool. They're they're doing pizza delivery. So, you no. Know, who knows? It could be that American regulation might actually stifle drones and someone else, like the Australians. Or, or Roger, I got a question for you. Yeah. So uh, you've been doing this for a while now. Yeah. And uh, I learned my business plan concept uh, more than a year ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure it's been hard this year, given so much has happened and so much attention has been with drones over the last year. Mm -hmm. uh, you still haven't got a product to market. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, really, I guess uh, it was it was kind of like in stages. The first stage was you you really uh, we really wanted to make this uh, this drone be able to fly and drive, 
and really it was just just for the dream. It wasn't really so much. I mean, it was yeah, we wanted to make a business or, around it, but it was going to just be too expensive, too difficult. Uh, something that I realized, um, especially when you want to sell a product like like hardware, like something that you want to touch, you need to cover all your bases. You need to think of how it's manufactured. You need to think of the cost of manufacturing. You need to think of the parts. And then because it's a vehicle, you need to think of its weight. You need to think of like, you know, all these different things. So um, something that we've learned is that um, you really want to make sure that when you're designing the vehicle, like on paper, you can build a lot of them. Like the Pegasus, which was the, the model we were working on before this, like it, it, it would have been really difficult to build it to scale. And it would have been really expensive. Um, we're thinking of other ways that we can make it. But really, like, um, for example, right now what we're doing in the garage is we're trying to find ways to reduce the time it takes to make these um, composite arms. So we're, we're doing these, like, basically these polyurethane molds that we can actually instead of taking like several hours to make the arm using 3D printing, we should be able to do it like in 10 minutes or something like that. How so the cost of those uh, arms? Because I, hmm? I was thinking that uh, how I ever realized some time back that plastics weren't very good and they built their baskets out of wicker and bamboo. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that was a practical material for a drone. Wicker and bamboo? It could be. Um, I mean, literally, the, the, the cool thing about these is that they have so much versatility. Um, no joke, a drone is basically what's important on a drone, I'd want to say, is it would probably be something like 30% of the value of the drone is in its electronics, and then 60% is in its software, and maybe 10% is in the actual frame. Like, it's all software. Like, the algorithms these puppies are running, they're really complicated. And what, what, what allows them to fly is basically they're getting a bunch of uh, sensor telemetry from a gyroscope, an accelerometer, a barometer, and sometimes even a magnetometer. And uh, it, uh, what really makes it a drone is it needs to have GPS. Like it needs to be able to do autonomous functions. If it can't do autonomous functions, it's not a drone. It's a radio controlled aircraft. Um, so basically you have all, the, all these things coming in. The frame could literally be made up of two sticks. You could get like a, go into like, uh, as long as the sticks are balanced, like, you know, more or less the same way. But you could like find like two sticks and you could basically screw them together like that, put motors on each of the corners, put props, like, you know, get some zip ties, put your speed controllers, and then just like zip tie your microcontroller on top of the two sticks. Bam, you got yourself a quadcopter. Like, really. <laughs> It's what all the magic in the quadcopters and hexacopters and everything you see, it's in the software and in the electronics. But yeah, no, so you see, that's a domino copter. This happened about 11 months ago, and this was in the UK. Um, so, so yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, it's a really exciting industry. Like, I can totally see there being a drone in every house in America in the next decade. Like, I can see myself waking up on a Saturday morning like, you know, opening up the fridge and there not being any milk. And I'm in my pajamas and I really don't want to get in the car, cha well, change, get in the car, and then go down to H-E-B, get my milk, drive, like go in line, pay for the milk, and then come back, get in the car, come all the way back home just so I can have my cereal. Like, <laughs> it would be so much better if I could just send my drone to go and pick up my milk. And, you know, five, ten minutes later, like, you know, there's my milk outside my door. And I didn't even have to get out of my flip-flop. You know, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I can step on an airliner and know that I can get to my destination there. The track record is very good, mm -hmm. especially because they have redundant systems up with them. How many of those props can you move and still have the thing fly? Uh, that's, that's a really good question, actually. Um, for a quadcopter, uh, it's really difficult to lose a, like, a prop and stay airborne because the orientation which the other props are at, like it would be really difficult for even it to function as a tricopter. Actually, there was a, just about a week ago, there was an announcement that somebody had ma done some software that did manage to recover if one uh, quadcopter was out. Oh, wow. It's a top left video. Top. It clips a few of the wings and the... Oh, yeah, no, that's, that's the propellers, though. Um, 
But but yeah yeah I know what you're talking about. You know what? That's all software. That guy, he's like a software wizard. Like um, those two are actually those two people. They're like industry experts. I know the guy in this, on the bottom one right there, Vijay Kumar. He basically runs the robotics uh, center at the University of Pennsylvania called GRASP. And those people, they've been able to have quadcopters basically almost build houses completely by themselves. Like they get blocks, they just start stacking these blocks together over and over again. And it's, it's ridiculous what, what they're doing with these things. But like I said, it's all in the software. Like what, what can you program these things to do? Right now, it's really we're we're in the garage and we're trying to find out how we can build this, like how we can build multiple, like more than one, like in a short period of time. Because right now, the the technique we are using to make these, we're three D printing the arms and then super um, uh, reinforcing them with uh, fiberglass. And the thing about that is that takes way too much time. So basically, what we did is we. Um, we use a 3D printer to be able to create these mold cavities that we're actually going to be able to inject um, uh, polyurethanes where we just mix these two urethanes and we stir them together and they begin to expand and then we put a, a plate on top of it and then basically once it's done like you know it sets like in about 10 minutes we open it we pull it out and we got ourselves like you know an actual mold then we overlay that with fiberglass and then we basically can destroy the mold because it's only like 50 cents worth of material and then bam, we have ourselves our fiberglass like you know frame. So that's what I was saying when Dr. Sargent asked like what we've learned. Like we've learned that you really, if you want to make a product like um, like you need to uh, you need to be able to take into account like like that you can make it like a lot of them. I know that there's a famous story that there's two people that invented uh, something called the integrated circuit, which basically caused the digital revolution. One was uh, a scientist at Texas Instrument up in Dallas. His name was uh, Jack Kilby. And the other one was um, the co-founder of uh, Intel. Uh, his name is Robert Noyce. And the cool, th the cool story about it is that Noyce basically created um, the silicon uh, integrated circuit uh, using something called a planar process, which allowed, which allowed them to make integrated circuits like to scale the operation. Whereas Kilby, he did it using something like a gold, gold threaded wire technique using germanium that you just couldn't, it would have been impossible to be able to build them to scale using Kilby's method. So I guess in a way, Noyce was the one who won like that battle, being able to create the IC, but not just be able to create the invention, but be able to like make enough of them that you can sell them on, on the mass marketplace. So. I have a, a question that's more. That mm -hmm. It's it's gonna be of course the FAA the FAA is gonna want their pound of flesh yeah it's it's gonna be heavily regulated uh, I know it is I mean what they want to avoid is they want to avoid another 9/11 they don't want a drone like fl crashing into a building in downtown Houston causing a fire or something um, which which leads me to believe that. They're only going to allow drone traffic in cities so long as they're completely autonomous. I don't think they'll ever allow, like the way that we have freedom of driving our cars like down streets, I think the drones are never going to be able to experience that kind of uh, freedom. I think it's instantly going to go into something like the Google driverless car, but up in the air that, you know, you basically will be able to use your drone, but you'll only be able to like use it pulling out your tablet like sending it from one location to another. In terms of piloting it, going from there to there, I don't think they'll ever let you do that. At least not in cities, maybe like in the country or something, I don't know. But, but that's just my opinion. That's how I think it will probably happen. Um, kind of following up on what she said. Mm -hmm. So has regulations and laws been like one of the largest like, have you faced any other sort of resistance other from the government? Like uh, it's, it's, really, it's really just uh, the FAA regulations. There was an interesting development that took place. Um, it was the week before spring break. Um, this lawyer actually won a landmark case against the FAA, basically causing the... The FAA right now basically was able to regulate the drone industries, the drone industry, 
because of they're kind of using like the radio controlled laws that they made like decades ago and the attorney basically kind of overruled that so right now technically speaking well it's being appealed by the FAA but the FAA lost the case that the FAA cannot regulate drones in the United States right now but no one really wants to test that kind of like test the waters right now I know there there's this one startup in San Francisco called Kui Kui which Kiki, there you go. Or, I thought it was Kui Kui, like Kiwi or Kui Kui. Uh, that basically, um, you can actually, the, there's this, uh, it's Q-I, uh, Q-U-I, Q-U-I. Basically, in San Francisco now, they've already launched a service that you can get things like from your local Walgreens or Rite Aid, or like, you can basically get small packages, like, um, delivered to you. But the thing is, they don't actually deliver it at your doorstep, they drop it at your doorstep. So, like, you need to actually hope it's not something that can break. It's and quickie. That's what, it's not a kiki, it's got to be quickie. Quick, quickie. 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 There we go. Yeah. So yeah, I know. This, basically, as soon as the FAA said that, you know what, the, uh, I mean, they made that ruling that the FAA couldn't regulate drones, bam. This, these people like showed up like not even a week later. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah. Lost the lawsuit. There we go. So... Have you had any pushback from the local RT community, do you believe or not? Hmm? Like, I've, I've heard that RT people are, don't like drone people. Is that true? It's, it's kind of true because, uh, uh, like, honestly, I think they, they get a little upset because the media has a, a habit of, if it flies, it's called a drone now. <laughs> like, and that's not true. Like, it's a drone if it can do, if it has autonomous functions, if it can work autonomously. If you see a person, you know, with their quadcopter like that, like, oh my god, look, it's a drone. That's a radio-controlled quadcopter, like, you know. But who knows, it might have GPS, it might be able to do drone, like, like it might have drone-like capabilities. But I think the radio-controlled hobbyists get upset because, like, you know, the media is basically just taking pictures of RC aircraft and, like, slapping it with a drone. Then the FAA, there's already a stigma with drones with the FAA, so the FAA is tightening its leash to, like, you know, try and... Actually, what I read was they didn't like people that used the apps to fly it because it made it too easy. Oh, really? Okay, well, it could be that, too. could be that, too. So, I don't know. There's... Any other questions? Mm -hmm. I have one last question. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think it's something like you can't fly within four miles of an airport. You have to fly below, I think it's 400 feet, but it could have been 500 feet, I think 400 feet. And it needs to be within a um, line of sight the you entire time. You can't interfere with radio transmissions of, of commercial and regular aircraft. Yeah, that too. You can go higher if you're being in a balloon, you're taking up to the upper atmosphere. Because I know people have I think. controlled jet planes. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. I mean, if you're if you actually have a FPV, which stands for a first person view, um, does that count? It like I mean, it it is still in your line of sight, except like you know it's through a screen. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no. I mean, I'm not I'm not really sure. I'm not the person to ask that question. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Roger. And mm -hmm. thank you for coming. Yeah.